Hi, so this is um, part two, part two of my story. I just thought it was interesting, I just sat down here next to my hospital file, so I was talking in the last video about how you can get your notes from the hospital. <laughs> this is how big my hospital file is. I'll just drop some stuff out of it. All my notes from all my scans and hospital appointments and um, also all the support I've had. So I thought I would start by talking about support. Um, the practical support, so Macmillan are amazing, the uh, Penny Bronze Centre have been amazing, um, Macmillan put me in touch with a couple of other charities that have been able to support um, paying for counselling, um, organic, my organic veg box, um, there's a local charity here that does treatments, um, and offers homeopathy and nutrition advice for free. That's the old mill trust. So anyone who's kind of local in the Wales area, in fact, they go quite far there from, I think they do something in Swansea as well. Um, Maggie's Trust that's based at the hospital. But all those, are, you know, I just always encourage people to reach out and, you know, see what's out there, see what support is there for them. Um, on a more personal level, very early in my diagnosis, you know, I was really sitting with what's the lesson here? What what is it that I really need to see? And although there was the obvious connection from the womb work to connecting with my cervix, um, there was a massive sense of you know, my heart being cracked open um, to self-love, but also allowing myself to be loved. So I started a Facebook group called Let the Love In, which was primarily for me to have a place to ask for help. Um, and it's one of the hardest things for a lot of us is to ask for help um, and, and feel that we deserve help. But actually, my experience has been people really want to help. People want to be told what to do, to be given practical ways that they can support. Um, they want to be involved and they want to um, be able to support in whatever way they can. So, you know, and it's one of the things that when I'm supporting other people, it often feels like the biggest block is um, really letting that love in and really letting people help in whatever way they can. And... Now, I've been so blessed to have an amazing community around me, you know, I, and partly I'd built that community up with my red tent work and the um, workshops that I'd run and all the people who've made drums with me, um, you know, all being able to help in so many different ways. So whether it was from having the kids for me, being able to donate on my GoFundMe, towards all the kind of medication and treatments that I was having, just sending cards, sending little gifts, just letting me know that they're thinking of me, sending Reiki, healing in whatever form, um, praying for me, oh, you know, drumming for me, <laughs> you know, the list just went on and on. Um, yeah, and then I ended up opening that group up earlier last year when the first lockdowns happened, just so that other people could share that space and really feel um, the support just, you know, from whoever was in the group, really. Um, so, you know, that was another thing that was really big, actually. That was a really big... I remember kind of sitting in meditation and just getting that, you know, you're going to have to ask for help and that the resistance that I had and the really strong message coming in going, just let the love in, just let the love in. You know, it was big. That was a really big one. So, so yeah. And again, you know, s s being in a place where you have to surrender to have that help. Um, and I remember I was having, been having counselling on and off the whole time. Ever since my first diagnosis, I had quite intense counselling and I've continued to have counselling. And it's really helped me with the decisions that I've made from my treatment. And... Um, so when I got to the point where surgery was an option, fear started to come in. 
and my council was kind of like, <laughs> at last, at last we get to the fear. And, you know, she was like, what was, what's your biggest fear? And it was just like lying in bed for six weeks recovering from an operation. And it was like, really? That's your biggest fear? And it was just like, yeah, that complete surrender of, you know, not being able to, to do what I'm used to doing. You know, I'm, I'm an active person. I'm full of creative ideas. I, I do, do, do. And I was really being given that lesson of like, it's time to be, it's time to be. Um, so that was a massive surrender. The fear continued. I did some Brandon Bay journey work to really kind of go into the fear and what the, the core of the fear was. And I also saw a clairvoyant because there was part of me that, felt like you know we are living in last year was particularly intense and it felt like death was really at the forefront you know a lot of people we were being told a lot of people were dying because of covid i had lost people um not to covid other things but i felt like a lot of light workers were popping off that's what it felt like people who've been here doing amazing work were despairing <laughs> were dying we we're going to the other side to and it felt to me like they were going to the other side to continue their work supporting in spirit and I did have a fear that that was my maybe that was my destiny maybe this was actually the point in my <laughs> lifeline where I was going to pop off um, and I didn't want to, I didn't, although there was part of me surrendering to, surrendering to that process, I didn't actually know, I had no control over if that's what's going to happen, if cancer's going to kill me, if the operation was going to kill me, if the anaesthetic's going to kill me, if, you know, whatever, I'll get run over by a bus tomorrow, what is going to kill me, I don't know, but, um, yeah, so I, cho I chose to see a clairvoyant because I felt like I needed some reassurance and I had an amazing session um, with a woman called Sabrina in Glastonbury who was recommended by a friend and she just confirmed everything that I'd known um, about myself, about sort of past lives, about the work that I'd chosen to do in this life. Um, you know, the reason that I'd done womb work, the reason I'd been constantly looking for my tribe, for my community, um, you know, running women's groups, um, red tent groups, all of that stuff was all about me seeking for those, for that tribe, for that, that like-minded group of people, you know, calling in my soul tribe, really. Um, and also that I was so open. And she said she could feel these, she described them as a grandmother's, kind of almost piling on all the stuff she you know she's a warrior she's a strong woman she can take this you know here's some more stuff for her to deal with here's some more stuff for her to deal with and I, and I'd had that over and over in my life where I'd almost you know I'd been on the floor and I'd just be going okay life what more are you gonna give me what more have I got to deal with you know almost like really even more even more and it just my life had just constantly been like that you know I kind of feel like I've cleared a lot of karmic debt this lifetime it's like I've lived four lives in one you know being a you know a young teenage mum single parent um getting through addiction recovery getting cancer <laughs> getting through that you know being a mum again you know I became a mum again in my late 30s um so you know I fitted a heck of a lot into my life so this, you know, this has just been another part of the journey and, we, you know, this has been the biggest adventure so far, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, all the emotions came up. So, you know, facing death, um, facing that fear, some of the tools that I was given by um, my friends and people I work with were amazing, just rem reminding me, really, because I had all those tools already, but reminding me to send Reiki ahead to the hospital, send Reiki ahead to the 
people that were going to be working with me, trust that the right doctors and the right nurses were going to be put in place, the perfect people were going to be put in place to support me, um, even down to whoever was on the ward with me, it was, was going to be the perfect people to be on the ward with me, you know, just kind of visualising that every day, doing my affirmations every day, that, you know, my soul is perfect, everything is perfect in God's eyes, I am perfect, I am perfection, which was really difficult when I was doing things like, you know, massaging my body, giving myself wound massage, and I could feel these tumours growing every day, and kind of trying not to get freaked out by feeling these tumours under my hands, you know, as I was massaging myself and just really loving myself and loving my body, giving gratitude to my body every day, you know, gratitude is the first thing that I would do when I open my eyes because otherwise this voice would come into my head going, you've got cancer, you're going to die, <laughs> you know, so which I think is perfectly normal when you get a cancer diagnosis, you know, you do spend a lot of time, you know, that's the first thing you do is wake up going, oh my God, you know, you can't, you kind of forget and then, you, and then it hits you. And I would also get into a place of what more can I do to heal today? What more can I do? Which wasn't a healthy place for me to be in. So just switching that around to gratitude and also having my iPod next to my bed where I could just plug in a healing meditation straight away to stop my head going crazy. So I was doing all of those, um, all of those practices, you know, to continually talking to friends. At, you know, at that point, I had a couple of friends also in the going through their cancer journeys. Um, so you know, having that little support group, that little bubble of people you can talk to. Um, and yeah, just kind of keeping your, keeping yourself up, up as much as you can really. Um, so, so yeah, so we were in this time when, when COVID hit and I'd had this, um, it spread to, well, we think it spread to the ovaries. They didn't, don't actually know until they do a biopsy. And I didn't, I'd said no to a biopsy because they were going to remove them. I was like, you can biopsy when you take them out. So I'm gearing up for going into hospital. Um, I had to completely isolate for two weeks because of COVID. Um, weirdly, I had a bleed in that two weeks. So it was like my my goodbye to my womb, having a last bleed, being able to kind of do a ceremony. Not many women know that they're going to be in menopause <laughs> in a couple of weeks time. Um, so it was really kind of embodying that, um, doing a little ritual to kind of say goodbye. You know, I went down to the river, bathed in the river, gave my blood um, to the to the river. Um, yeah, that was quite powerful. And and still sitting in the unknown of not knowing whether you know what the what the actual surgery was going to be so there was massive surrender massive trust um my one of my amazing friends Eartha had put together a group a small group of women on a facebook messenger thread who were all going to support me going into hospital so you know i'd i'd had um, one of my counseling sessions and my counselor had talked about a friend of hers in mexico who'd had cancer treatment and had had surgery and in this treatment centre they had a homeopath, a shaman and the surgeon and an anaesthetist and, and I was just like, you know, wow, when are we going to get to that point where that's what our medical system looks like? So, you know, I'd, I'd seen a homeopath, I had all my homeopathic remedies, I'd seen an amazing flower essence woman um, and got my flower essences which were all about holding the vulnerability as while being a warrior because that was my biggest you know one of the biggest things was like that vulnerability and that's the you know being in bed for six weeks not being able to do anything you know having to let myself be vulnerable um so we were putting everything into place we had this group of group of women on this facebook messenger that were going to drum and pray. I'd specifically asked a couple of friends, my Reiki teacher and Eartha, who's a shamanic practitioner, to just really 
hold that space for my soul because I don't know where the soul goes when we're an, under anaesthetic and I, and I still don't know after be, being through that it's literally you go under and then you open your eyes and it's like you just close them and open them you know four hours had passed and I don't know where I was at that point but um, I went into hospital the night before my operation I was due to have the operation at eight in the morning um, but there was a bit of a mix-up and I hadn't been given the blood thinners in time so they I think they gave me the blood thinners around midnight so they had to wait 12 hours for those to be take to work so I had to wait until later in the day for my op and it all just felt perfect the timing of everything felt perfect um, my surgeon came to see me literally just before I got wheeled down you know signing all the paperwork to give permission and she said if it's spread to your bowel do you give us permission to remove your bowel and I was just like what and I looked at her and I was just like well so what does that mean and she said oh we'll remove your bowel and you'll have a stoma and I was like what's a stoma so that's a, a bag basically that where your that is your bowel basically carries your poo um, and I just, I laughed, I was like, seriously, you're asking me this now, just before I'm about to go into surgery, you're asking me to make this decision without being able to do any research or talk to anyone about it, and, you know, I looked at the nurse, and the nurse looked at me and kind of shrugged, and I just said, okay, I surrender, do what you need to do to get the cancer out of my body, <laughs> just do what you need to do, If if that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do um and that's you know that was the pat the story of every step of the way it was just like okay I surrender okay I surrender um I mean that still kind of feels unbelievable to me that you know they would wait until that time to put that throw that in as a um something that might have to happen but it was interesting because I was also overhearing someone in the next bed I mean they draw the curtains around and they're having these really private difficult conversations that everyone on the ward can hear but you know someone had come in and they were having a lump removed from their neck and um, they were being told it was a really easy op and then they would be in and out and they you know it might they might feel a bit sore I think they were saying they were going to take her tonsils out as well but you know they were kind of making out it was a really easy normal procedure and that woman didn't come back to the ward um I could hear the nurses talking and basically when they opened her up it was breast cancer that had spread up and she'd had nine hour surgery and had come out with no breasts and at no point was she told that that might be a possibility so in one way I was grateful that I had been told that and that it was a possibility even though um, it didn't end up happening so so yeah another level of surrender and and it was interesting because when they they come to wheel you away for the operation I just had such calmness come over me and and I knew you know I'd put on my group right this is it I'm going now and I knew that all those women and friends and kids and my husband were all holding that space for me Um, so I got, yeah, you get wheeled, you know, everyone's masked up because of bloody COVID and I was a bit like, God, am I going to be in this mask this whole time? Of course, I forgot, of course, they'd be putting gas and air over me <laughs> and anaesthetic. So, um, yeah, and the, you know, the nurse kept coming up and holding my hand and going, you okay, you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I, I did, I felt so calm. I actually felt the presence of my dad come in and the presence of another friend who died come in and you know this friend was like we're going dancing Rach me and you we're going for a dance I was like okay and I could almost hear the drums playing my w women friends just drumming I could I, I actually had a point where I wanted to get up and dance because I could feel this you know of almost elation this you know feeling that I had and then yeah then it's you know you're anaesthetized, you're knocked out, and I opened my eyes, and I was immediately with it, 
which I know from previous experience with people who've been sent Reiki and had healing that they are a lot, a lot less groggy. And I just said to the surgeon, so what have I got left? <laughs> and she said, um, we were able to take your ovaries. They weighed two and a half kilos. Um, there was 1.8 litres of fluid, which we drained. Um, some of that fluid, they said, was from the cyst that burst, but there was already fluid in my belly. I mean, I looked about six months pregnant, so it didn't surprise me that, you know, they'd had that much fluid in there. Um, but we couldn't remove the womb and we didn't remove your bowel. Your bowel's fine. And I just burst into tears because I knew that my womb was still there. It still had eight centimeter tumor in it and I was going to have to do chemotherapy, radiotherapy, which I hadn't wanted to do. And I, again, in that moment, just surrendered because I had, I had re a really strong sense of guidance that I, if they wouldn't take, if they couldn't take my womb out, I would go down that route. That's what I would need to do to stay alive, to stop the cancer. And it felt very right. It just felt very right. And I know so many people were really shocked that I chose that, having been you know, someone who had done natural healing my whole life, you know, always use herbs, homeopathy, you know, my children are not vaccinated. To kind of make that decision um, but to me, it was like, that was choosing life. I'm choosing life, you know, and I may be completely bald, <laughs> which is what chemotherapy does to you. I've got fake eyebrows on as well. Um, it's, well, you know, fingers crossed, it's done its work. So I had, um, I had... The operation, I was out of hospital within 24 hours. As soon as they get the catheter out of you and you can walk, they want you to go home. Um, I was actually on my own in the ward. There wasn't anyone else on the ward with me. So I treated it as a kind of little retreat. I'd taken some nice juices with me. You know, didn't you don't eat much in the hospital. The food in the hospital is dreadful, so I wouldn't recommend eating any of it. But because of having an operation and having anaesthetic, you know, you don't want to eat and, you know, you can't eat for a while and then you don't want to eat. So I was glad to be coming home. We set up a rota of food being delivered. So I think for the first three weeks or so, most nights, you know, we we had someone dropping off food for us. Um, and, and I actually enjoyed being in bed for, I think, it was probably about a month. Um before I could you know potter around a bit um again it was like it was like a retreat I had to really just see it as a retreat and there's always you know we can always keep ourselves busy I had plenty of books to read stuff to watch on um my computer I'd signed up to do a course with Joe Dispenza that was all online so you know I had plenty of things to watch to keep me going keep me entertained in bed so um yeah it was fine my husband found a beautiful antique commode that we could put in the bedroom so I didn't have to worry too much about going up and down the stairs to get to the loo um I would say going to the loo was the strangest experience after having oper being operated on um yeah just kind of that you know I had a scar they basically cut me from just under my ribs to the top of my pubic bone so you know it was really big big surgery four hours of open abdominal surgery while they kind of I guess felt around and found out what they what was there um so yeah once I'd once I'd recovered from that um then it was back to Swansea which is where I'd had my op, where my oncologist was based for an appointment with um, another oncologist to talk about 
treatment um, and I at that point I first of all I'd been told I got the results back from the biopsy of the um, ovaries which took them about four weeks and I was told there was cancer in one of the ovaries the other one wasn't but because the cancer had spread to my ovaries I was now stage four which is the last stage there isn't another stage um, you know cancers metastasized you're stage four there is no cure so again another level of surrender of kind of like okay um, and I just told myself I'm the same person I was two weeks ago this diagnosis is not going to change me I'm not going to buy into their their terminology as far as anything as far as things concerned for me nothing's changed you know except for the treatment plan so the doctor at that point was saying chemo radiotherapy combined but when I actually went in for the appointment they said we'll do chemotherapy first and we'll see how that works and then we'll make a decision on whether we do more surgery radiotherapy just radiotherapy um, whereas I'd been told when I was in the hospital after having just had my ovaries removed before the biopsy that chemotherapy would be enough to shrink the tumour and they wouldn't need to do a hysterectomy so that's still up in the air so yeah so I start I started chemotherapy in September I've had it every three weeks um, pretty high dose two different drugs I was in hospital all day um, one drug takes three hours the other one took an hour and and they give you steroids and things like that and then you have medication to take when you come home which are the more steroids which a lot of people don't like taking but I actually found they help me feel normal so I did take the steroids and the anti-sickness pills and the constipation medication um, and it was own and I had in between I had massage I had um, acupuncture every week which again one of the charities paid for six sessions of my acupuncture um, which I which I just think kept me kept my body in a good place um, after my first round of cancer um, my friend Sally died her cancer had spread to her brain and um, Although at the time, you know, we were kind of prepared for that happening. What I hadn't wasn't prepared for was the next round of chemo I had. I felt so ill and my head went to a really dark place. I think I was in the grief of her death and I was in this kind of, well, what's the point? What's the point if treatment doesn't work? You know, she'd had chemotherapy, she'd had radiotherapy, then she'd had more radiotherapy. And I was just, I felt, was feeling quite angry and and ready to give up, absolutely ready to give up. And I went to see my acupuncturist and he, it was just wonderful. I mean, it was not just the acupuncture, the, he just gave me a pep talk and he was talking about how chemotherapy is not only killing the cancer cells, it's killing all the cells and it's killing your soul. It's, it's attacking you on all levels. So he gave me some really good kind of massaging around here to keep your spirits up you know spirit really similar to where you do EFT tapping and so with what you know I was prepared for the next round of chemo that I needed to up asking for help again you know it's like bring in the help make sure you've got zoom calls with friends um, food you know people dropping around food um, book in sessions so I also booked in session with a kinesiologist and a shamanic practitioner as well as my acupuncture as well as my massage some reflexology um, you know all of anything everything <laughs> pack it in to support myself um, and I just made sure I did that between each chemotherapy round um, apart from the last one where we've again been in complete lockdown and um, practitioners haven't been working so that that was pretty tough and it's only the last two rounds that I've had neuropathy in my fingers and my toes um, you know apart from that I've had 
slight nausea. I've continued to eat because I was losing weight, so I've just forced myself to keep eating. Um, you know, the steroids make you crave crap food. You just want to eat pizzas and cake and toast and chips. And I haven't let myself do that. You know, I've been making myself smoothies and juices. Um, my, I had a session with my nutritionist, so I was just like, I'm really craving carbohydrates, what can I eat? So she said, well, have some buckwheat, have some amaranth. Um, so I've been making buckwheat porridge and buckwheat bread. Um, amaranth porridge as well, sort of having that in the morning, which, which has worked to kind of um, support those cravings. Um, and the mistletoe therapy, and I've had IV mistletoe between each round of chemotherapy, and I'm going to continue having that. Um, it's recommended that to continue for about a year after um, cancer's gone. I mean, I, I had a scan last week, so I had a scan after the third round of chemotherapy, and the tumour had shrunk by half. And I've had a scan last week, so I'm in the void of waiting for scan results at the moment. And, you know, a lot of cancer groups, cancer people refer to scan anxiety of kind of waiting. And although, um, you know, I'm kind of just putting it out of my mind, I noticed I am at this kind of in a heightened kind of, I wouldn't say it feels like anxiety, but the slightest thing is pissing me off, so it probably is. You know, my tolerance levels really go down when I'm in this place of kind of just waiting, waiting for the news, waiting. You know, my oncologist will get that scan result and then they'll have a team meeting without me and discuss um, what the next steps are going to be. Um, my ideal is that I'm on the golden time life, timeline of health, that I will get a clean bill and I'll just continue to do mistletoe therapy. Um, second to that, I would probably go for surgery over radiotherapy, partly because I've just, from the cancer groups I'm on, um, there's two different kinds of radiotherapy they give for cervical cancer. One's called brachy, which is an internal radiotherapy where you stay in hospital for about three days and you have these rods inserted up your vagina. Um, and they're just, you know, low-level radiation. And the side effects for the bladder and the bowel just sound horrendous. Years later, women still having bowel and bladder problems. And even the external radiotherapy can have that effect um, from reading and the research that I've done you know there's a bowel card you can get so you can flush it in restaurants <laughs> to show that you need to go to the toilet really quick and I was just like oh you know I feel like I'm too young to be dealing with things like that so I would prefer not to be doing radiotherapy but you know I would have preferred not to do chemotherapy and if it's going to save my life then I'm open, um, but those would be my preferences. So we shall see. It's been quite a roller coaster. Um, I'm really up for answering questions. If anyone's got any questions and wants to um, talk further about it, or if there's bits that I've missed out that you want to ask me about, I haven't really talked about my protocols because there, there's a lot of them on my blog, and my protocols have changed quite a bit. Um, and my diet has simplified quite a lot. I did do two years of plant-based keto, which I enjoyed and I felt really good on, but I got to the point where my liver couldn't really deal with all the fats. So I'm actually on a completely fat-free diet now, um, just eating fruit and veg, you know, keeping my diet really simple, no nuts, no seeds, um, just cutting out all the things that my body, your body struggles to digest those things. So you know, keeping it really simple. Um, and I'm working with new practitioners now. I'm working with a guy called Mark, who's in an Australian biohacker who analyzes my bloods. And um, I'm, I'm working with him for the next year. So I'm kind of trusting that the work I'm doing with him is really gonna help my body to completely recover. And again, it's kind of like not rushing into being completely well again and going gung-ho back into life, really 
um, s slowing down. And I feel like that's been the gift of having cancer in lockdown is that it's allowed me and my family to really slow down and um, value each other really and value the gifts of time that we've been given. Um, and, you know, just for anyone who's got kids who I haven't really talked about, but, you know, we were straight up with the kids right from the start. Um, obviously, I think the, the hardest bit for them was when my friend Sally died and, you know, my little one who was seven then just said to me, but the chemotherapy is going to work for you, isn't it, mummy? And I just said, I hope so, because we don't know. You don't know. And, and actually, you know, a lot of people don't go down the chemotherapy route or the radiotherapy route because there is a kind of they want to protect their children and they want, don't want their kids to see them being ill was actually it's really brought out a beautiful caring side in my children that they hadn't had the opportunity to express before to want to look after mummy to want to you know go and make me a drink or get me a hot water bottle or come and snuggle up in bed with me and watch a movie to draw on my head <laughs> <laughs> draw on my bald head um you know there's been kind of laughs making fun of me having no hair making fun of me drawing my eyebrows on because they've never seen me kind of wearing makeup so you know there's been there's absolutely been gifts in it and I think also for me just grabbing every opportunity with my kids to have fun and to create memories which maybe I would have just taken for granted before so you know there's there's gifts, there are absolute gifts in having cancer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's no one, it's the club that no one wants to join, <laughs> but I've met some amazing people in this club and I've done some amazing things and I've actually lived my life to more fully these last few years than I was living it before. So I think that's the, that's the lesson. And I keep saying to people, you know, you do, you won't get this time back. We won't get this time back. So just keep living, keep living life as fully as you can, um, because you only get one shot at it. So I'm going to leave it there. I will be back when I get my scan results and let you know how I'm doing. But um, that's that's my story up until now. The roller coaster of cancer. Um, and hopefully this next year is the, the year of health. <laughs> Sending you all so much love. Thank you for witnessing my journey. Thank you for witnessing my story. And um, yeah, and, and do, if you know anyone who might need some support and that my website might be able to help them, the resources page is the first page to go to really. Um, videos, books, some meditations, things like that. Um, yeah, it's all in there. All right. Lots of love, everyone. Bye.